Hey, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, why ever you're doing it, and whoever you're doing it with, welcome. Glad to have you here. It's me, Legal Vices, and today is Monday, so we all know what that means. It is Maritime Monday. Uh, all right, let's catch up with how everybody's doing today. It's good to be back. We didn't have Maritime Monday last week because I felt as if I was on my deathbed. <laughs> I, I recovered. So we're back here for more fun and festivities. Uh, yeah, this week is going to be a, this week is going to be an interesting one. A couple of people suggested it last week and, uh, I started reading about it. And the more I read, not only did this go to the top of the Maritime Monday list for stories, um, uh, as some of you who may have caught a few, a uh, few little hints in some of my conversations with, uh, Steve Gosney or Andrew Branca. Um, I'm in the very, very, very earliest stages of putting together a Maritime Monday related book where we're going to be showing you know, some of the, the interesting disasters and successes in maritime history. Um, I've already decided this book is going to be the lead story in the book. The, 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 the Batavia is going to be the lead, the lead story in the book that I am eventually going to get around to writing. This just shot to the top of every list I have about maritime and maritime disasters. All right, let's go looking through here. See, we've got uh, Sovereign Bosman giving us the early Dutch naval disasters hype. Alan is back from his vacation. Welcome back, Alan. Welcome back from your month-long vacation, Mod Alan. We're going to be doing a little Dutch naval disaster down around pre-Australian Australia. So we're going to be heading down towards Alan's way here with our story this evening. Rose, Mod Rose in the house. What's up, Mod Rose? Glitter fart, you're always here. Glad to see you. Uh, Clouds Illusions, hey, welcome. Welcome, Cloud Illusions. Great to see you here as well. Andrew Brunton bringing it. Great, 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 great. Oh, how? So you're still suffering from the Hawks Bay uh, weather-related issues. Guys, that's got to sort itself out quick. You've been going on for a couple of weeks. You've been, uh, you've been stuck there. Joe Choi in here in the house, as always. Welcome to see you. And scrolling down, we got everybody else. Chaos, oh, Chaos Coordinator. We need to start off with Chaos Coordinator. He dropped a, assuming he, I don't know. Chaos Coordinator, he, she, they, <laughs> whatever. Uh, Chaos Coordinator has dropped in yesterday's video a super thanks. So anybody that's here now can come back later. Anybody that's watching this on the replay clue, that replay crew that's something you can do right down underneath the video somewhere there's a super thanks button so if you don't catch us live you can drop in a super chat live via a super thanks and i'll be sure to acknowledge that on the following program so thank you very much for dropping the 10 pound super like deeply deeply appreciated uh andrew brendan says you're nervous about watching anything with water well there you go this is this is Australia. It's water uh, and a lot, a lot of, a lot of it actually. As we get going through today, you'll see the story if you're not already familiar with it. So, all right, let's kind of scroll down through here. Oh, we have Alan kicking us off with the first super chat of the night. I'm back, lol. Thank you so much, Alan. Deeply appreciated to have you back. I hope your much needed therapeutic vacation was therapeutic for your soul. Welcome. We're glad to have you back. Lady Magdala, I might take my screens back from the hubby. Jeff looks way better on these, but hubby bricked my laptop, so I'm using his computer anyway. Um, I don't know what that means, but okay. Uh, I hope I look better on uh, on whatever screen it is you're using. Yes, the bulldog is walking around one of them. The other one is sitting there on, directly behind me on the floor. Uh, both of them are huddled up together. Hey. Hey, guys. All right. There you go. Now the other one's moving. Hi, Strawberry. What's up? All right. Well, that brings us up to speed here. We've got all the uh, the initial super chats and super thanks out of the way. So let's do our normal uh, little front end, you know, housekeeping stuff here. We've got our like and subscribe poll up. We've picked up quite a few subscribers over the last week and a half, two weeks. Deeply, deeply, deeply appreciate that. We're closing in on thirty four thousand uh, a, a week. Well, actually, two weeks, I guess. A week from this coming Friday will be the F at Friday, and it would be awesome if we could celebrate a 34,000 subscriber stream. 
along with the normal Effort Friday activities that we do once a month. But we have the like and subscribe poll up, so make sure you hit the like button on your way in here. We've got 205 viewers currently and 137 likes. Get down there and hit that like button. Make sure you're subscribed. If you haven't subscribed, please do it. If you are subscribed, please make sure you are still subscribed because of YouTube. Uh, and then come over here and take our like and subscribe poll. Today, these are all elements of the story we're going to get into today. I click the like and subscribe button like a mutineer stabbing a survivor. Like smashing bones on the wheel. Like a ship crashing on the rocks. And like chewing on a fellow passenger because because here you go you guys you you ride or die maritime monday crew you've always liked it in the past when we get into cannibalism now is the return to cannibalism there's there's 100 more cannibalism than there was in the previous maritime monday story. Well, actually, there's probably more than 100 there's a lot of cannibalism in this story like like a lot uh, so we're going to be getting into this story now before we all right come on strawberry you got to get off the headphone car ah! There we go. Strawberry <laughs> had the had the head for and had the head, the earphone cable wrapped around a leg and decided to go for a walk. <clears throat> All right. There we go. Hmm. We're back. Okay. <laughs> now that's had my ears ripped off. Wait. Uh, All right. We kind of came came a little bit loose there. All right, there we go. Dang it, she just pulled everything out of whack here. Hang on, give me give me a quick second. All righty. Welcome back, everybody. Hi, it's me. <laughs> oh, I love when that happens. All right, today, the video that we're going to be looking at, the, the main basis for this video, is from a new channel I recently found. And quite frankly, they have the best video on the mutiny of the Batavia that I have seen, and I watched them all this week. I don't even really know how to, there is so much involved in the story that I really don't have any idea of the order. There's so many sources I want to pull from, but this channel, they're called Retired Afloat. It's a, uh, and that's their channel name, Retired Afloat. And uh, they, they sound like a great group of, like a great couple. They're in their, if you go to their about section, it says, we're an Australian couple who took a chance and retired early. We purchased a boat in England, cruised it across the English Channel to France, and now spend much of each year cruising around the rivers, canals, and coastlines of Europe. In October, when it gets too cold for us, we put the boat into hibernation somewhere and continue our travels. We spend much of our off-season traveling the world on luxury cruise ships, giving speaking presentations about some of the great maritime adventures and explorers. Follow our travels for these speaking presentations and tips on our travels. And uh, one of the presentations they did, one of these lectures was on the Batavia. It doesn't it doesn't have all the fancy, uh, you know, production values and things of other videos that we've watched, but the storytelling is top notch. I mean, this the the, the mental images you can get painted from this story are are enough. Uh so it's there's there's, there's the, the presentation, I mean, it's like it's not this high high super produced thing but it's a great lecture stories and there there's other there's other videos on the on the playlists here that if you go to the channel they've got some of their own private stuff they've got uh vasco da gama they've got uh some things on, on the new ghost ships there's the contiki expedition the lost franklin expedition and we're gonna be doing the lost franklin exhibition expedition uh, at some point in the next couple of weeks, Shackleton was at the, and they do, he has a Shackleton video as well. Shackleton was at the South Pole. The Franklin expedition was looking for the Northwest Passage in Northern Canada near the North Pole. So we're going to be doing the, the Lost Franklin expedition a while later. Not sure what, whose video we'll use as the basis for that, but you, you've got to, uh, you've got to go check out this channel. Make sure you go there. The links are down here, down below for the, the channel itself and for the link to this video. If you want to watch today's video in its entirety without my annoying commentary as it goes through, but please do give them a subscribe and a like small channel. Let's, uh, I think it would be a good surprise for them. I sent them an email to let them know we're going to be using this video today and it's saying if they have any problem with it, I'll be happy to take it down, but I'd like to use it and maybe interview them in the future, but they have 865 subscribers. I think it'd be a good present for them if we can get them up to a thousand subscribers by the end of the day. That'd be fun. Uh, if, if they could get 135 subscribers by the end of this show. 
So if you're if you're thinking about looking for another maritime related channel with a few videos on it, a smaller channel, consider going over today with the links that are down below in the in the description to retire to float and liking and subscribing to their channel. All right, with that out of the way, this is the Batavia. This may be may very well be the worst maritime disaster story you will ever ever hear. Uh, oh, Lee. Leafy Fifi Fufu says the <laughs> says the link in the description doesn't work. All right, hang on real quick here. It should. I, I checked it out. It worked for me. Well, let me let me go down here and check. Dang it. Do 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 do, do my channel. That's where we need to start. Click on this. All right, we don't need to hear myself talk. My show more description. Uh, if you want to watch full video without commentary, click. Okay, the uh, full video without commentary link works. And the the channel. Uh huh. Well, that the channel thing doesn't work. I'll I'll repair that here in a little bit. I it it would take too much time to do now. I will do it later. But the channel is. As I said, retired abroad. Well, let's just let's just do that right now. Why? Like the, the, we, we're not restrained by time today because there there is no Murdoch trial going on today because it's a holiday in the U.S. So let's do this. Retired abroad. Retired abroad. Sire, sorry, retired afloat. Dang it, retired afloat. Not abroad. Retired afloat. Why have I been saying abroad? Maybe because it's, I'll retire abroad. Is retired afloat. All right. And I will go back over here and I will revise the description. Give me just 20 seconds here. And then we'll get on with the shoe. Or my content page. Sorry for this. If you don't want to watch this you, and you're on the replay crew, you can just skip ahead a few minutes. All right. Pulling up my description. Huh, that was kind of weird. Don't know how that happened. Uh, today's wonderful channel. Boom. Be tired afloat. Here we go. Do, 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 do. Let me type that in. Retired afloat. All right. Done deal. Let me save it, and then we will jump into today's show. All right, great. It should be working now. Sorry for that inconvenience. Sorry for the bother. Sorry for the delay. Where are we going to start this story? This story involves a ship, the Batavia. But uh, where did the ship come from? This ship was owned by the Dutch East India Company, or VOC as it's known to the Dutch. <laughs> and to understand really what's going on in this story, you have to understand a little bit about the du the Dutch East India Company. They they were primarily a company that involved trading, uh, you know, just around the world. They 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 were all over the world, mainly in Asia, trading for for goods and services both ways. When oh, Alan has gifted five Legal Vices memberships, if you were one of the lucky people that caught a a subscription from, from Alan, please give him a thanks. That would be deeply appreciated. And as long as we're doing the super chat thing, let's get this one out of the way. Bass, if you smash too hard, you might retire abroad. <laughs> mm. Now, see, they're going to watch this, and then they're going to yell at me because of you. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah. All right. Thank you for that, Bass. Uh, deeply, deeply appreciated. Uh, but the, I mean, the main things they were the main things that they were trading was spices from uh, Southeast Asia and China and teas in, in your salt. I mean, just anything that were like herbs, spices and things like that could be sold at 10, 12, 20 times the value, the purchase price. And the, uh, the dust, come on dog, stop it. I'm trying to do a show here. Stop snorting at each other. The, the company was the, 
one of, if not the largest companies on earth. It was clearly the most powerful company on earth. It was started in 1602. So it, it was around a long ass time ago. <laughs> 1602, the company was founded and it had been granted a 21 year monopoly on trade in Asia. This one company had the had power to trade solely and singularly throughout Asia. And this company grew so strong and so powerful that it, it essentially became a country in and of itself. In all respects, the company would enter into treaties with governments. The company itself, not, not the Netherlands, <laughs> the company would enter into treaties with governments. They had the ability, they had semi like quasi governmental powers. They had the ability to wage war. They could imprison and execute convicts. They were courts. They were military. They were diplomatic corps. They had their own money. They established Dutch East India Company colonies. They were colonizers, bankers, courts, administrators, judges. I, <laughs> this was a powerful, powerful company. They had almost, and this is in, in 1796, they had almost a million Europeans working in trade in Asia. That you know, they were they were not their direct employees, but related to them and helping with their work. Nearly a million people working for them in 1796. So how I mean, when you say they're big, how big how big are they? Well, I guess to summarize. By 1669, the Dutch East India Company, it was the richest private company in the world, in history, in the history of the world. They had 150 merchant ships, 40 warships, 50,000 employees, a private army of 10,000 soldiers. This is a company. The company has 40 warships and 10,000 private soldiers. So you are dealing with, essentially, as we said, a, a quasi-governmental agency. This would be like if Elon Musk went out and started buying tanks, warships, and building his own Musk army. So yeah, it was a it was an amazingly powerful company. And the Dragon's Treasure, unironically, would I aspire to be just less evil. <laughs> and the the dragon's treasure tea is someplace you want to go by the way i got to do a little grift for the dragon's treasure tea go to the dragonstreasure.com to get some of the finest loose leaf and bagged tea you will ever ever have in your entire life got a rotating stock of up to 60 teas every month he's got a monthly membership program and right now in my cup as we speak i have an amazing tea called spirit bomb the uh, the, the package is over in the kitchen, but there's like 20 different ingredients in this spirit bomb tea. It is so flavorful. Uh, it's it's now my second favorite tea that I've had from the Dragon's Treasure. So you definitely want, if you love tea, go to the dragonstreasure.com. Use code VICES, get 10% off your order. You get 10%. I get a 5% kickback. It's win, win, win. Tea man makes money. You save money, and I get a kickback. So do that. That's the uh, Dragon's Treasure grift of the day. All right, let's get into the story now. We've given you a little bit of the history of the East India Company. So now let's see what they're going to do. And this the, the lecture series from the, uh, the Retired Afloat, they're going to give also a little bit of a history on the East India Company. Uh, but let's, let's do this. And like I said, it's, it's more of a lecture with a few uh, visuals thrown in. But the story is spot on. And we'll be stopping it to give our commentary as usual and to bring in other outside bits and pieces of information that I think add to the story. So let's uh, pop this bad boy up. And the true story of mutiny, massacre, S-slavery, outstanding seamanship, survival, 
and revenge. Let's not forget torture, murder, and cannibalism. This is an absolutely true story of the mutiny on, on the Batavia. Right. Am I going to, uh, I'm going to understand involved. a little bit about the Batavia, you have to understand something about the company that created the vessel itself. And that was the Dutch East India Company, or as it was better known, the VOC. And this was the most the biggest, most All right, how's the, how's the volume? Is that good? Most ruthless company in the history of the world. Um, when they were created, they were given some incredible powers. Um, they had the power to create their own military force, their own army and their navy. They could negotiate treaties with other countries or islands or sultans or, or rulers of, of places. And when you've got your own army and navy, it's pretty easy to negotiate treaties. They could... And like we, like we just said, they had a 10,000 soldiers strong private army that they could put on 40 warships and go anywhere in the world they wanted. Wage war, and they did on several occasions. Uh, they could issue, or they, they could uh, torture, trial, imprison, and even execute people, often without any sort of jurisprudence or rule of law whatsoever. And we're going to we're, we're going to hear about all of those things very shortly. Torture, trial, imprisonment and executions as well as other stuff. They could issue their own currency and they could control the value of that currency against currencies around the world and they've given the full powers to act. I cannot turn it up. We are up to 600%. This is as loud as it goes. If you want me to turn down if if you want me to turn down my volume I can so it's uh, so it's easier for you to uh, adjust your volume, then I, I will do that. The only thing I can really do is lower my volume. So I'll, I'll, I'll talk here in a little bit and we'll, we'll try to do that. From the bottom of South, uh, of South Africa, uh, Cape Town, where we're gonna be in maybe in a couple of weeks time, and the, the Straits of Magellan at the bottom of, uh, of South America. Now, these are the powers of a country but this wasn't a country. This was a company. All right, I pulled a, I pulled my volume way down. I'm talking over him on purpose to just to see how it sounds. So let me listen to it here real quick. All right. Well, that answered that question. So I'll pull myself down just a little bit more. They had to report to a board of directors, and all they were interested is one thing and one thing only, and that was profit. It was all there was to it. Now, see, this is and the important thing right here. We know thing. we know that all this mar good maritime stories start with profit. That's how they all start. Profit, profit, profit. And this is a company that has built itself an army and entered into treaties with governments. And I, that they're doing this all for profit. This is the richest company on earth in the 1600s, 1700s. And it was eventually dissolved right around the end of uh, the 1700s. But it was a powerhouse for nearly 200 years. Can you imagine if, like, if uh, Apple or you know, Microsoft or whatever literally controlled all trade essentially in, a, in half of the earth for 200 years? Mm, well, let's keep going with the story. Thing at that time around the world was spices. Now we take these things for granted. Now we go to the supermarket, we can pick up spices anywhere in the world. But at the time, spices from the Far East were the most valuable commodity in the world. They are worth an absolute fortune, and this is where the VOC made a lot of their profits from. Now I said it was the um, the most profitable country in history. Now. Down here, you've got uh, Apple. Now, see, that's one thing that, you, that needs to kind of understand a little bit. If you hadn't thought about it, maybe didn't know about it. Every voyage, <laughs> you mean Amazon? <laughs> yeah, if like Amazon controlled the world for like 200 years. But I mean, that's one thing you have to understand when looking at this, this trade and how it worked. It, it wasn't, I mean, now we can pretty much sail anywhere in the world within you know 45 days to 60 days at the latest you can go from sail from any place to any place else that wasn't quite how it worked back then every single voyage 
was an adventure, a high risk, a possibility. It was a gamble, essentially what it was. When you would send a ship out, you had no idea whether that ship was coming back. You hoped it was, and you had you bought insurance just in case it didn't. And the 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 shipping industry gave rise to so much of everything we have today. The, the insurance policies, um, you know, cr- lines of credit, things like that were were perfected under the maritime industry. Uh, Alan says, Jeff, no one can hear your video. Um, I don't think so. There, everybody seems to be listening to it. Um, yeah, we they have subtitles, I think. So we're asking for subtitles. Why, yes. All right. We now have subtitles. All right. And so what would happen is you would be somewhere, say, in the Netherlands, and you want to get something from from Southeast Asia, from Batavia, which is now Jakarta, I believe. So you'll want to go, you want to sail down to Jakarta to get spices. And then you have to load the spices and perhaps you know, sell some along your way, stop off somewhere in the Middle East or whatnot. It could take two years for your ship to get back to you. It could t- so these voyages could take up to two years or more even, depending on where the stops were and what was going on. And that would that would lead to a lot of trepidation because a lot can happen in two years. And so it literally was a gamble every time that ship went out. And I mean, there, when we think about waging war, we don't just get on. I mean, now we can we can start anywhere and we can be at war with somebody anywhere in the world in a matter of hours. The if you look at the history of, uh, of like the opium wars in China. That would happen to you where the, the, the British, they, they wanted to work with, you know, in, in the opium trade and whatnot, and the Chinese said something offensive to them, so the, they would have to board a ship, go all the way back to England, explain what happened and why everybody should be upset and why they need to go to war. Then the country would have to organize an army, they would have to get the ships ready, get everything provisioned, they would have to load the ships with the army, send some overland to China, then they would have to ship some around all the way down around Africa, all the way up, back up to China. And it could take three, four, or five years from the time someone says, I think it's a good idea to start a war until the war actually begins. Because the the, the shipping and the transportation was not as, as safe, direct, and quick as it is today. So th- yeah, that's... When you're saying that a company is the most powerful company in the world back then under those conditions, that is seriously saying a lot. And Microsoft corporations. Bill Gates is probably going to become the very first trillionaire in, in history. But at the height of its power in today's sort of money, the VOC was worth nearly seven and a half trillion dollars. So an incredible amount of money. And as I said, with their own army and their own navy. And when they, they conquered me, a, um, a... I have an idea. Would you like me to bring up the video so you guys can watch it too? What do you think? You guys want to see the video with me or should I just watch it by myself? <laughs> All right. I'll share with you guys. Come on. Let's watch the video together. I won't be stingy. I won't hog, the, I won't hog all the video to myself. All right. Let's do this. We're going to become the very first trillionaire in, in history. But at the height of its power in today's sort of money, the VOC was worth nearly seven and a half trillion dollars. So an incredible amount of money. And as I said, with their own army and their own navy. And when they they conquered a a little fishing village in Java, um, they renamed that uh, village Batavia, which is now known as Jakarta, the capital of Indonesia. And that village became the most important trading hub anywhere in the world so when they decided that they were going to yes this is an australian gentleman ship much bigger and more powerful than anything that had ever been created before they decided to call this first of these these line of ships batavia after the other jewel in their crown which was the city of batavia in java and it was built in 1628 it had a length of 56 and a half meters a beam or a width mm-hmm. of 10 and a half meters and a height 
of 55 meters. So it was taller than this ship that we're on at the moment. It could not pass under the Sydney Harbour Bridge. And in fact, when the, the replica of the Batavia came out to Australia. Yes, everyone, this is an Aussie speaking. <laughs> Are we? Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to equalize myself here. I'm down, my own volume is down so damn low, but let me, let me bump it down some more. I hope you can, I hope you guys can still hear me because I, now I'm like 20% <laughs> on my volume. All right. This is, this is literally the best I can do. I can't hear myself anymore. All right. When we look, this is actually a replica of the ship. They've, they've rebuilt the Batavia. And so this is, this is, exactly what the Batavia looked like when it was built in 1628. It's not a StreamYard thing. It's just the, uh, the original source video. It's being recorded as part of a lecture on a boat, so it's not the, it's not the greatest audio. It's, it's quiet. So there we go. <laughs> Leafy says, that made zero difference to my volume? Huh. Well. That's the best I can do. It's it, it. All right, let me. I hate I hate that I have to do this. I'm going to have to go back into into the bowels of of uh, what you call here, Streamyard, and and alter it in Streamyard. All right. Now, all right. Bear with me here. I'm listening to myself as I talk. I've taken it off auto mic adjustment. And I'm. All righty. There is literally nothing else I can do. The volume is, is at 17%. Uh, and I've got the video. So we're just going to have to deal with this. Apologies. Deal with it as best you can. It's a great story. Let's just get through with it here. Um, so yeah, this is, this is a replica of the ship that was made, the Batavia. It's a beautiful ship, great ship, and as you can see, it was pretty darn big for 1628, 56 meters, 186 feet long, and the important things to notice, again, as we were talking about, it has 24 cannon on board this thing, and it carried 12 sil chests of silver, 250,000 guilders, 4th century Roman cameo Reuben paintings. Uh, the captain was, we were going to be talking a little bit more about the, about the captain. He was age 33. He was a senior merchant. Um, I don't know what the life expectancy was in 1605 or 1628, but I imagine it wasn't a, a healthy long life like we are today. Many years ago, they had to dismantle some of the, um, the, um, the mast and wait till hot low tide before they could pass under the Sydney Harbour Bridge. So it was a, a very big ship. It had 24 cannon on board, which were used for offensive as well as defensive purposes. And on this particular voyage, this maiden voyage, they were carrying 12 chests of silver worth about 250,000. So did you notice that? Maiden voyage. How many, how many maiden voyage disasters have we had on this channel so far? Uh, that, that's, that's where we are. It's a maiden voyage disaster. Let's go. Thousand guilders or about six and a half million US dollars in today's money, an absolutely priceless fourth century cameo brooch, and also two paintings from the Dutch Grand Master Rubens, which were on their way to be a gift for an Indian Maharaja. Now, the vessel, the entire voyage was going to be commanded by a man by the name of Francesco Pelsart, who at the age of 33 was one of the most experienced senior merchants in the VOC. And the senior merchant is the most important person in the VOC because they create profit for the VOC. Mm -hmm. The ship itself was going to be under the command of a man by the name of Ariel Jacobs. Now, these two men had worked together once before. They didn't like each other. In fact, they detested each other. They were chalk and cheese. Uh, Pelsart was your quintessential accountant type. He was slight. He was uh, bespeckled. He was very well educated. So again, this is how things worked back then. Notice the, I mean, now the captain is the boss guy on the ships. 
But here it was this the senior merchant. I guess he would kind of be like a superintendent on a vessel today. But he was the guy that told everybody what to do. He was the main man. So we've got the and these are all people that come into play later. There's a, a couple of others that are gonna be introduced as the story goes along. But Pelsert, 33-year-old senior merchant, he is the Lord God of that boat because he is the person, as was just said, he's the one that's in charge of profit. He's in that's the only thing the Dutch East India Company was worried about. They didn't particularly care about lives as long as it brought in dollars. And then we have Ari and Jacob. Not, not, not Ariadna Jacob. No. <laughs> this, this is different. This is Ari and Jacobs, and he's the captain of the ship. He's the guy at the rudder. And when you got Mr. Prophet, who really hates Mr. Guy who knows how to drive the boat, hating each other, we're not off onto a great start. Quietly spoken, very good manners, a gentleman, where um, Captain Jacobs was your, your big, burly sailor. Uh, he loved his grog, he loved his women, he, he settled arguments with his fists rather than there you uh, go. with a with a conversation. He's a man's man, in other words. He's a true Australian before the Australians were Australian. So, as I said, these two were chalk, or cheese, chalk and cheese. They didn't like each other, and that was going to cause problems later on down the track. Now, when the um, Batavia was actually first launched, it created an absolute sensation. Royalty came down to see this great new ship. Um, thousands and thousands of people lined the quayside to see the ship. Artists came down to paint it. And you can see the Batavia here. And these are some of the other uh, VOC ships um, that were going to join the Batavia on its maiden voyage. And I suppose the hype of this, this maiden voyage can only be compared to the hype surrounding the maiden voyage mm -hmm. of the Titanic. Exactly. I mean, that, that's, the, that's what I was thinking as well. You've got all, you know, you've got your passengers, you've got this great, beautiful ship, the, the flagship of, of your fleet. And here it is, it's launching on its maiden voyage to go seek profit in other parts of the world. And just like the Titanic, the Batavia was not going to survive its maiden voyage. No! Now, it sailed on the 27th of October, 1628, uh, accompanied by seven other ships, VOC ships, that were going to be part of this convoy to go to the, the Far East. On board were 331 passengers and crew, including a detachment of about 100 VOC soldiers who were on their way to the city of Batavia to reinforce the garrison there. Also on board was a man... All right, now here's, here's where we get the interesting people involved. We've got the, the money man. We've got the, uh, the captain. Now, now, now we get the interesting character. But it's interesting though there were 300 and past, 331 passengers and crew on this ship. And like I said, it was, it was part of an eight-ship convoy. And that also comes into play later. All of these details come into play. Uh, but this is the guy, Geronimus Cornelius. Keep your eye on this guy as we go throughout the day. And uh, her. By the name of Geronius Cornelius, who at the age of 30 was the junior merchant on board. So he was the merchant under Pelsart and probably the third most senior person on this whole expedition. And keep your eye out on him because he becomes the real villain in this story. Yes, and uh, he is a, a massive, just to give you a little bit of a spoiler here, he's a massive religious zealot and he doesn't, he, the, he's the junior merchant for the company, but he doesn't, VOC is the Dutch East India Company. Uh, if you go back and, and watch the beginning, you'll see they're, they were the most powerful company on earth at that point in time. Raised their own armies, made their own treaties with governments, had their own warships, everything else. Uh, but yeah, the Dutch East India Company. Ooh, well, so yeah, he doesn't, even though he's the junior merchant, he doesn't listen to the company first. Who does he listen to? Well, of course, God. Geronimus Cornelius talks to God, and God tells him what to do. So God, he listens to God first, and then the company. Spoiler alert. Also on board was a lady by the name of Lucretia Vandenmylen, 
and this painting probably doesn't do her justice, because at the age of 26, she was considered to be one of the great beauties of Europe of, of the time. She was the Sophia Loren or the Bridget Bardot or the um, Angelina Jolie of her time, a great beauty. And she was on her way to the city of Batavia to be reunited with her husband, who was a diamond merchant out there in the Far East. Mm. Now, the plan was that they'd come out in the North Sea from Amsterdam and travel down the west coast of Africa. But as soon as they got out into the North Sea, a storm hit the fleet. And the storm raged for three days. And after the storm had cleared, uh, only two other vessels were in sight of the Batavia. So they decided that they'd continue on the journey and they headed down that west coast of Africa, making very good time. And they actually reached Cape Town uh, a month ahead of schedule, which we won't do. Um, <laughs> on the way down, I guess that's Captain funny if you're on Jacobs that ship. made romantic overtures to the beautiful Lucretia, and these uh, advances were spurned by her, which made the captain very angry. Um, but as I said, they reached Cape Town in good time, and the crew were given some time off and Captain Jacobs and the junior merchant Cornelius went ashore and they went on a bender. They, uh, they were, got drunk for three days, they visited brothels, they visited taverns, they got into fights, uh, there was lots of complaints made about their behaviour and these complaints got back to Pelsart. And so when the two men finally came back to the ship, uh, he gave these, Pelsart gave the two men a very public dressing down. Here he re reprimanded the captain in front of his crew, which is just something you just don't, just do. don't do. And he told these two men that uh, once they exactly, that's just that is something. I mean, let's 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 go back. I mean, Pelser's a good guy, ish, but the the captain is the ultimate authority for the crew on the vessel. You don't go raking the captain over the coals in front of the crew and passengers. A very public dressing down. Here he re reprimanded the captain in front of his crew, which is just something you just don't do. And he told these two men yeah. that uh, once they got to the city of Batavia, their behavior would be reported and that effectively their careers were over. Now, hmm. these men knew that the VOC controlled everything. So, I mean, if they couldn't get work with the VOC, then they were going to be destitute. So now they had nothing to lose, and that was going to be a problem down the track as well. But yeah, when you're, when you're not where you need to be and you're out in the middle of the ocean and uh, you've literally made it so people have nothing to lose, um, plans start. As they came out, they were using the roaring 40s of the, the Southern Ocean to come across the, uh, the Indian Ocean and once again making good time. But before, as just after they left Cape Town, Pelsart uh, became ill and he was confined to his cabin for several weeks uh, with this illness. Sounds familiar? Um, and um, every day, the beautiful Lucretia would go to his cabin to tend to his needs. And even when... And uh, when they're talking about attending to his needs, he means tending to his needs. He became well again. She would go to his cabin to tend to his needs, if you know what I mean. Yeah. And once again, this made Captain Jacobs very angry and very jealous. Now, the fact that Pelsart was confined to his cabin for so long gave the opportunity for uh, Cornelius, the junior merchant, and Captain Jacobs to get together. And they decided that they had nothing to lose at this stage. Uh, they knew that their careers were over, so they decided, why don't we take this magnificent ship and all its treasure, this powerful ship, um, kill anyone who's not going to be uh, on our side and we'll sail off to the Caribbean and become pirates of the Caribbean. And with this sort of ship, they'd be unstoppable, basically. So they decided that they would start recruiting people to a mutiny to help them along the way. Over a period of time, they recruited about 50 or 60 men over a few weeks. But it, I mean, that's slow going. I mean, you can't put an ad in the horizon saying we're going to have a mutiny, uh, meeting about a mutiny um, up in the Spinnaker Bar at four o'clock this afternoon. Anyone interested? I mean, it had to be very secretive, very clandestine um, and, and slow going. And over a period of time, as I said, they recruited about 60 men to this mutiny, but they mean. Yeah. And so th this is like this is just something that everybody agreed with right from the beginning. This was something that as they as they went on, they, it fomented slowly. 
these two guys started it and it slowly slowly gained popularity as the as the as the voyage went on now the important thing to note here one of the few important things to note here about uh, Geronimus Cornelius um <laughs> the, the the junior guy he was actually married and this is he was married uh, and then in 1627 the year before the ship was built he and his wife had a son but the child died uh, less than three months old. The cause of death was determined to be syphilis. So that was kind of weird. Um, that caused a bit of a scandal. And the sort of, uh, be, he, he filed a lawsuit against his nurse, <laughs> seeking to prove that his child had contracted the disease from her and not from his wife. Uh, we don't know if his wife actually had syphilis or not, but... Uh, So he, he eventually found himself in the, the year or so later on board the Batavia. Uh, and it seems like his, his main motive for getting on that voyage was to escape from his social and economic situation back home uh, with his wife. And that's when he, be, he, he gets... He became friends with Arian Jacobs, the, the captain, and got himself on the ship with the company. And uh, that's when that's when they started their little their little plots and plans. Let's continue with our story. Oh, we got let's uh, catch up with a couple of super chats here while we're paused. Uh, Chaos coordinator, like I said before, England wanted West India spices, but still refused to use them in English cuisine. Seriously, worst cuisine ever. Now come on. Marv White, thank you so much. Noob question. Would it not make sense for maiden voyages to be the most risky for a ship, especially in the olden days? Yeah. I mean, you, that's when you find out what works and what doesn't. <laughs> um, but th this was a perfectly fine ship, and it's made it... Well, the same with the Titanic. It was a perfectly fine ship until it hit an iceberg. Uh, this was a perfectly fine ship until it wasn't, uh, which we'll get into here in just a minute. But yeah, the maiden voyages are always the... Uh, they do sea trials where, you know, they'll just like cruise around the neighborhood and whatnot and then see if there's any leaks, any big things like that. Uh, but the maiden voyage, you know, that's when you really put it to the test. And Jason B said, just watch Jason and the Argonauts for the first time. Awesome boat. You've just watched Jason and the Argonauts for the first time. That's one of my all time favorite movies. That thing scared the crap out of me when I was a kid. I, I mean, just that's one of the first things I ever remember watching on TV and it scared the crap out of me. All right, let's get back to our video. Is a, a lot more. So we got and 60 like guys. Said, they recruited about 60 men to this mutiny, but they needed them a lot more, especially with these 100 VOC soldiers on board. Now, as they were cruising along that, that Indian Ocean, one night when the captain was on, had the watch, he covered up the lanterns on the, um, the back of the ship. In now, you remember, they were in this convoy of eight vessels. There's one, this, this was a very, very smart move on, on behalf of uh, the mutineers to do what the captain just did. So that's how you could see the other ships. You, 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 know, you would have the lights on the ship and you could say, okay, you just keep everybody in line so you can follow each other. Well, he covered up the lights. On, had the watch. He covered up the lanterns on the, um, the back of the ship indicating where they were to the other two ships in company with them. And then he changed course by a couple of degrees. So in the morning, when the dawn broke, they were the only ship. The other two ships were no longer in sight, um, and they were now on their own. So that's how you help your they mutiny. They needed to recruit more. Than that's how you help your mutiny. You need to get rid of 100 soldiers. You need to, to make sure nobody can board you and take over. Well, you just hide yourself. You just, uh, you just make yourself a little bit invisible to the other ships and... Separate yourself. You're in a big, wide ocean all by yourself, and that really helps when the uh, when the captain's in. To this mutiny, so they came up with an idea where Pelsart would have to punish the whole ship's company uh, for something that had been done, and perhaps that would make it easier for them to recruit men. To Brilliant the strategy! Brilliant strategy. You, you see it all the time in like military movies and whatnot. One person screws up, and everybody else gets punished. 
So everybody else hates that one guy. That's what they're trying to do here on this ship. They're they're gonna they're gonna pull off this action that is so egregious. Everybody, everybody's gonna get punished, and everybody's gonna hate the the main money bags man, Pelsert. And that will add more people very rapidly to their mutiny. They'll be able to overtake the ship. Or will they? So they came up with a plan where one evening while the beautiful Lucretia was taking her evening stroll around the deck, she was attacked by a group of masked men. Now, according to the official log of the Batavia, which has yeah. been translated into this. English, uh, it says, hang overboard by her feet, the Lady Vanden Marlin, and indecently maltreat her body. So they grabbed her and they hung her over the side of the ship by her ankles and they threatened to drop her in the water, which would have meant death for her, obviously. But um, they pulled her up and they sexually assaulted her. Now, everybody knew at this stage that she was having an affair with Pelsart and that an attack on her was effectively an attack on him and he would have to take action. And because he didn't know who these masked men were, he would have to punish everyone. And that was the whole idea, that was the plan to be able to recruit more people to the mutiny. Now, as I said, it's a great idea if you want to commit mutiny to uh, do something that's going to make every that's going to make him hate everybody on the ship. But yeah, you, you you wherever that line is on what's acceptable, that's well over the line. Um, so let's find out how how it worked out for them. It worked out in an. It, 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 let's see how it worked out. But before anything could happen. Disaster struck, and on June... No! Oh! So they went through all of this to plan this great mutiny. They went and they, they dangled the woman overboard, and they SA'd her. And then on June 4th, 1629... June the 4th, 1629, the ship struck a reef on the um, uh, Houtman Abrahos, which is about 60 nautical miles off the coast of Western Australia, just um, west of Geraldton in, in Western Australia. Now, in the morning, this is the wreck side of the Batavia here. In the morning, it became clear that the vessel couldn't be saved. Um, so they lowered the long boats down and they transferred people to the nearest uh, land, which was Beacon Island over here. Now, this is, this is interesting. This, you know, you, you, put, picture in your head, you're, you're, you're shipwrecked, you smash up on a reef here where, where it's marked on the map. And Beacon Island is the closest place you can get to. So you're shipwrecked on an island. What's what's the image you have in your head of, of an island to be shipwrecked on? You know, mountains, palm trees, coconuts, uh, you know, whatever wildlife happens to be around there. Uh, you've, you've got this picture in your head of, of what, it, what an island would look like to be shipwrecked on. Now, whatever picture you have in your head bears no relationship whatsoever to what this island looked like. Beacon Island. Let's, uh, let's pull up a picture of Beacon Island. This is what it looks like today. Uh, just imagine it without the buildings. Uh, where are we? This is Beacon Island, where the ship with the 330 people shipwrecked. That's it. Those are buildings. That is a flat frickin' island right there. there. There ain't nothing on that island. That is as close as you can come to the dictionary definition of a deserted island. That is a desert island right there, off the coast of Australia. But, I mean, Australia didn't even exist at this point, so. Uh, Pre-Australian Australia. I mean, you're, you're looking, that is like a, a, a few meters wide at this side, and what, this is maybe 200 meters across? Perfectly flat. Exactly. Brownie was, incognito was, was picturing an island full of hot chicks, you know, like coconut bra, bras and bikinis and things. Yeah, no, that didn't happen here. Uh, that's it. This is the island where they were shipwrecked. So keep, as you're hearing these stories, Keep this in your mind. This is in the middle of the damn ocean. So listen to all of this stuff that went down 
on this tiny little lump of flat soil in the middle of the ocean. Yeah, this is this is the island they were shipped wrong. This this is Beacon Island. So let's uh let's see what happened on Beacon Island. And let's bring back up. We don't know. We don't want to bring up Beacon Island. We want to bring this back up. All right. So yep, yeah, that's Beacon Island right there. And Beacon Island is only a tiny little coral atoll, basically. There's nothing growing on it whatsoever. Uh, it's not very big at all. But over that day, all the survivors were transferred. Well, you, can, you can see the scale here. This is this is five kilometers, and this is just kind of a little dot. Over to Beacon Island, along with as many supplies as possible, food, water, tents, tools, uh, weapons, anything that they thought would be useful. Um, everyone was transferred over except for the junior merchant Cornelius and 70 men. They were ordered by Pelsart to stay aboard the wreck of the Batavia and guard the treasure because that hadn't been, they'd had the opportunity to transfer that at this stage. All right, now, now we're going to have to start taking notes. Now we've got two separate camps. The one camp that went to Beacon Island and then uh, junior guy, crazy religious nut job, junior merchant guy, and 70 people staying on the vessel to protect the, the treasure that's on board. That's, that's our first division. There's going to be more divisions of crew here and, and, and survivors and passengers in just a bit. But right now we've got the, the junior guy and 70 guys, and then the rest are on the island. Now, when um, Pelsart got to Beacon Island, it was very obvious that there was nothing here to sustain them at all. They didn't have enough supplies to be able to feed all these people until, um, well, forever, because there was no chance of a passing ship going by and rescuing them. So he realised that they would have to rescue themselves. So he and um, Captain Jacobs decided that they would take the ship's longboat, which is, um, this is a replica of the... Okay, so... Now, you remember, you might recall when we talked about the Shackleton expedition, how they had, were basically in the same situation. we got to leave some people in this camp. We're going to try to go. We're going to sail. I, th I think they sailed like 900 nautical miles to another island, and then they finally were able, after several attempts, to get help back, and nobody died. Well, this isn't that story. This, uh, yeah, this, uh, this isn't that story. Same idea. Little open boat here. You may, you may recall the Shackleton expedition. They cannibalized, so to speak. We'll get to that in a minute. They cannibalized a couple of lifeboats and created a little miniature sailboat out of it to allow the Shackleton expedition to sail off to get help. This, they just used one of the boats, long boats here, but still the same deal. The little open boat, tiny little, tiny little sail to see if they could go get some help. That that long boat, a thirty foot long boat. Uh, and they would sail to the Australian mainland, see if they could find food and water there. If they couldn't, they would trans they would try and make it to Batavia to get a rescue vessel. Yeah. Now, because mind you, there were no Australians, like foreign Australians. There were the Aborigines in, in Australia. The uh, what do we call them? The, I don't know what the proper politically correct term these days in Australia is, but like the the first peoples, I think they are. Uh, they were there, but there were no. No outside. These were the first people to come to Australia, essentially. These guys right here on this boat. And now they're going to try to get back to Indonesia, to Batavia. Now, anyone else on, the, um, on this island could see that this wasn't going to be a really good place to be. No one wanted to stay on Beacon Island. So in the end, 48 men first nations, into okay. this 30-foot oh. long boat, along with... You do the math there, 48 people in 30 feet worth of boat. That's, uh, yep, that's less than one person per foot. So <laughs> that's pretty tight. Provisions, so food and water and uh, navigational equipment, etc. 48 men in a 30 foot boat. So it was very, very cramped, but no one wanted to stay on the island. And these 48 men were all the most senior people in the party all the VOC army <laughs> officers, all the senior crew members of the ship, everyone who uh, had any seniority whatsoever was in this longboat. As it's so how does this sound to you? You're, you're there on the island. 
and they're like, okay, we're going to, we, we're going to send some people to go hopefully to find some food on the, uh, on the mainland. That's supposedly, hopefully somewhere over there or to get back on the, to get back to Jakarta and bring help. Um, you guys stay here. We are taking every single important person off of this island with us. I, I, I don't know. It doesn't take much critical thinking to arrive at a conclusion that uh, they're like, we're just going to get the fuck out of here. Good luck. That's kind of what it sounds like to me. <laughs> All of the officers and super important people, we're just going to get in this little boat here. We promise... We'll go find help and bring it back. We pinky swear we'll be we'll be right back as soon as possible with help. Well, let's see how it worked out. <laughs> but that's what I would be thinking. I would be like, um, why don't why don't you choose like half a dozen of you really important people to stay with us here on the island, or why don't you take a few regulars, a few you know normies with you? But no, now remember. There's still the religious zealot number two guy, Geronimus Cornelius, on the boat, protecting the treasure with 70 people. Don't forget about him. He's not going on the longboat. He's staying there. It sailed off. And it sailed off over the horizon. It got to the coast of Western Australia. Okay, now put yourself back on the boat with... Uh, Geronimus Cornelius and his 70 men. You're the number two guy. You're the junior bag man. Uh, number one bag man, he told you to stay there. Number one bag man, the captain, and every other important person, you just watched them sail away without your ass. Geronimus Cornelius doesn't take that too well. They weren't able to find any food or water. So in the end, they decided to make for Batavia. And in what was one of the great open boat voyages in history, which is rivaled by um, the, the one by Bly when he was cast off in the mutiny of the bounty, and he had to make it to, um, to Timor. Um, they spent 33 days in this open long boat crossing the, the oceans, sometimes through storms. That actually made is it really to impressive. Batavia are after only 33 days, which was an that, yeah. incredible feat of seamanship. Yeah, that is really, actually really, really incredible, especially in the crowded and cramped you know, conditions that that ship was in, going through storms and whatnot. MG Law says that's smart. Take all those with seniority and leave. Yeah. It's kind of like Star Trek, you know, where, oh, there could be there could be danger and death and mayhem down there on the planet. We need to take every important person on board the Enterprise down there with us. And uh, Yeoman Jones. We know who's going to die. <laughs> but yeah, that's what they did. They took everybody. And what, what happens when you leave a bunch of people with no authority figures around? Well, if you've read the book Lord of the Flies, you kind of get an idea, except uh, that doesn't even begin to scratch the surface of what happened during this case. Yeah, this, uh, this, is, this is like Lord of the Flies on steroids. And it largely went, and they didn't lose a, whole, a single man during that, that voyage. And it largely came back to the skills of two men uh, one was Captain Jacobs, who, despite his issues, was an extraordinarily gifted seaman. And the other person was the chief bosun. Now, as soon as they reached the city of Batavia, on the orders of Pelsart, both those men, the chief bosun and Captain Jacobs, were immediately arrested. Um, okay, well, I bet, the, yeah, I bet that was a surprise, wasn't it? <laughs> you go, whew, we got off that island. We've had all this time to kiss and make up. You know, we, we may not like each other, but uh, whew, we made it through. Now we're safe. We're happy. We're, we're here in, in Batavia again. And then you're promptly arrested. Well, shit. Guess, guess we should have stayed on that island. 
Let's see what happened to these poor folks that were arrested. Men, the chief boatswain and Captain Jacobs were immediately arrested. The captain? Um, they'd been talking the longboat about this potential mutiny aboard the Batavia. Oops. And that word had got back to Kelsart during this voyage. So Now, seriously, guys, the time for the mutiny is over. It's done. The ship is wrecked. You're trying to save your ass. You're trying to get off this island and make it back and resume your life in a normal way. If there's anything you could have talked about during that 33 days other than the mutiny that you weren't able to pull off. Why would you do that? You're on, a, you're on this tiny little 30-foot boat. That's 10 meters. You're on this boat that's not even 10 meters long. And you're talking about your plan to take over the ship and kill the guy that's in this little boat with you. Word is going to get to him. What do you think is going to happen? <laughs> he's going to hear about it. He's, he's 10 yards away. He's, he's 10 meters away. He's going to hear it. But no, these two geniuses, the captain and the bosun, were talking about the failed attempt at mutiny. Well, dang, there you go. So Captain Jacobs was arrested. He was taken to prison in Batavia. He was tortured for three months to try and find out what was going on. And he eventually died in prison after three months. Yeah, so do the math there. Um, Again, this is this is the uh, mid to early 1600s. We didn't really have all these fancy schmancy new new laws to protect people uh, in the presumed innocent until proven guilty kind of things. Uh, we want to know more about this, so we're just going to torture you. Uh, and you know, torture in the 1600s was pretty freaking bad. Uh, we're going to hear a little bit more about to torture coming up later. Uh, but yeah, they tortured him for three months, and he died after three months. So you do the math on that, and we'll let you extrapolate the mysterious cause of death of Captain Jacobs. Yeah, so he was tortured for more information. <laughs> oh, dear Lord. All right, while we're here, let's uh, hit pause here. Well, why didn't they just kill Pelsert at any point during this journey? I would imagine they thought all was forgiven. Well, first of all, he didn't know about the mutiny until he heard them talking about it on the boat. <laughs> they were going to be free. They were sailing for, for home. Well, not for home, for, for civilization. They were on their way back to Indonesia. And this guy didn't know about, Pelser didn't know about the mutiny until he heard them talking about it on this boat, the freaking idiots. Ah. Uh. Yeah, that would be interesting Chinese whispers. Well, there's not a there's not a lot of space for the messages to get twisted out of the seaman where Captain Jack Zinkbeard Murphy. <laughs> solid take, Solon the Lich. Solid, solid take. That's that's the comment of the day so far. All right, thank thank you for sharing that, I guess. Uh Oh, Corn Pope asks innocently, did everything on the like poll actually happen? Oh dear. I I I I I couldn't print all of the things that happened on <laughs> on this, but yes. And let's see, we're we are now currently an hour into this. So let's do our, our midstream poll here. We currently have 537 of you watching this. That's actually really, really high for a Maritime Monday stream. I thank all of you for coming here for this story. And if this is your first story, you're in for a doozy. Because so far we've talked about mutiny, shipwrecks, dangling, you know, like people having affairs on board the ship, uh, profit seeking, um, SA, uh, you know, maltreating a woman that was being dangled over the side of a vessel in order to to get everyone punished so that they could foment this mutiny. We're not even started with the bad stuff yet. This is just, this is the aperitif. This is the appetizer. This is the, this is the, the, the foam on top of uni resting on a, on a saltine cracker that you're, you're given in a restaurant is an aperitif. We're going to get into the, the steak a little bit later, 
But uh, please, those of you, you know, you that are here watching this, this is what we do every Monday. They're not nearly as dramatic. This is probably the worst Maritime Monday story you will ever, ever hear. Uh, but, you know, there's, there's other disasters we cover. And we're going to be covering some rescues recently, too. <laughs> but hit that like button. And if you haven't subscribed and you feel so inclined to do, please subscribe. And if you have subscribed, please make sure you're still subscribed. Today, let's see how we're doing on the, on the uh, poll so far. I clicked the like and subscribe button, 13% of you says, like smashing bones on the wheel. We're going to talk about that in a bit. That, that's grim. 24% of you said, like a mutineer stabbing a survivor. Oh, there's going to be plenty of that coming up. And 29% of you said, like chewing on a fellow passenger. We'll get to the cannibalism in a bit. Yum, 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 yum. And in the lead with our like and subscribe poll is, I click the like and subscribe button with 33% of you saying, like a ship crashing on the rocks. Well, we've already got to the crashing on the rocks. Uh, now comes the rest. <laughs> we're, just, we're just getting started. This is a rough story. It's great. I love it. And like I said, to the, 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 the few of you, that, there was two of you that uh, recommended this last week. Thank you. This just shot straight to the top of my list. And as I said, this will be the lead story in my forthcoming book. The chief bosun had had nothing to do with the mutiny whatsoever. Um, Poor bastard. He was just listening. He had committed an even greater crime. Than mm. All right. Now, th this is serious. Yeah, this, this, is, this is time out levels of seriousness. We've got, I mean, the, the, the captain was rightfully punished, I, whether, whether he was rightfully tortured to death. I mean, that's for you to decide. Yeah, morals of, of the 1630s, 1628, 29, whatever the hell it was. Uh, the bosun, he was just there like listening to the stories of the mutiny, but as they're saying here, as, as our guest, as, as our guest video host is describing in his lecture, the retired afloat people, this bosun committed an even greater crime than mutiny. What do you think was the crime even greater than mutiny? What could it possibly have been the crime even greater than the crime of mutiny? Yes, Quicks, it was a simpler time. S.A., no. As, nobody cared about S.A. back then. Buggery, no. Cannibalism, no. Stealing, you're, you're close. You're close to stealing. Let's find out what it was. ...to do with the mutiny whatsoever. Um, he had committed an even greater crime than mutiny. He had lost the Batavia. He was the navigator for the vessel and he was on watch the night the Batavia hit that reef. So he had cost the VOC profit. That is the crime worse than mutiny. He cost the company money. He unfortunately happened to be the guy holding the wheel when it hit the rocks. So, so there you go. He, <laughs> that was the crime worse than mutiny, worse than taking over the ship, was actually losing the ship and costing the company money. As you said, Quicks, yes, Ferengi. <laughs> pretty much. Now that I think about it, the Dutch East India Company pretty much were Ferengi. <laughs> they had all their rules for profit making, and that was the only thing. Profit was the only thing. You go to war for profit. That is hilarious. Conan the Brobarian now has the, the comment of the day <laughs> comparing the Dutch East India Company to Ferengi. If you don't know Ferengi, watch Star Trek Deep Space Nine. Oh, my Lord. Yep. All right. That's it. He cost the company money. That was his big crime. And Flux, I didn't forget it. You're right here. Jeff's polls are the only polls I take. Flux, if only you were interested in taking my poll, you could have it. But take my poll anytime you want. It's still there. It's available if and when you want it. If you know, you know. All right, let's get back to this poor bastard. What happens if you commit the great crime of losing money for the Dutch East India Company? 
which is something you just don't do to the VOC. So he was taken out and he was immediately hung. Now, that was bad news for both of those men. Death. But it was really bad news for the people back on Beacon. See, now you kind of get a little slap on the wrist. They tell you, don't hit that other ship again. You might lose your career, but you, eh. yeah, you're not killed now if you, if you accidentally run a ship aground. <laughs> it's, it's not the death sentence, but this was like, oh, uh, you wreck, you were the one that wrecked the ship. All right, let's take you out and hang you. <laughs> Boom, that fast, he's gone. Uh, Britt Cormier, yeah, losing the ship is a crime against property, and that, in capitalism, is the worst, lol. Serious Ferengi rules at play here. I should do that one day, if I ever remember. Get, like, uh, all the, I, someone's put together a list of all of the known Ferengi rules of profit and compare them to the Dutch East India Company. That'd be fun. But thank you so much for that super chat, Britt Cormier. Can Island, because those men... Uh, where the best that right, was, he was immediately hung. Now, that was bad news for both of those men, <laughs> but it was really bad news for the people back on Beacon Island. Right. <laughs> it was really bad news for the people on Beacon Island because the two people that, A, knew where they were and could, B, navigate back to them are now dead. <laughs> Oops. You've just killed the two people, the only two people that can find the survivors. And it's not even really about finding the survivors, is it? You've just killed the two people that know where that gigantic ship full of all that fucking treasure is. Oops. Didn't think that one quite through. An island, because those men uh, were the best equipped to lead a rescue mission back to the island to pick them up. As it was, Pelsart was given command of another vessel, the Sargon, within a week. And he was told to go back to the site of the wreck and collect the treasure. And if, you know, the main purpose was to collect the treasure, if by some chance you found, came across some survivors, then you can pick them up as well and bring them back. <laughs> Isn't this the greatest company ever? Like I said, you got to go back and find that ship. Find all of that treasure. Find the, the, the Reuben paintings. Find the 4th century Roman cameo. Find the 12 chests of, of what was it, uh, guilders, you know, 250,000 guilders or whatever the hell was in those. Find that treasure. Oh, and if, if there's still some people alive on that little flat piece of dirt, yeah, you, you, you might want to bring them back. Like, literally, the survivors were not even an abs a thought in their head. It was They were an inconvenience. But mind you, while they're gone, there's still stuff going on on board that ship. So, But the main issue was the treasure. And even though they were in a much faster vessel than this longboat, uh, they took almost twice as long to get back to Beacon Island as the little boat had taken to get to Batavia. And that was going to spell disaster for the people on the island. All right, so we got the time frame here. 33 days from the date of the, of, that they left the island, from Beacon Island. 33 days to get to Indonesia. Within a week, they've, <laughs> they've put them back on the ship. They're going to be torturing the captain to death. Uh, and then, you know, the other guy they just promptly got rid of him because it was his fault. So to get back, he said it took him twice as long. So you're looking at two months, so give or take four months that these 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 poor survivors have been on this this little flat piece of of coral reef out in the middle of the ocean. Four months at least they've been alone. What could possibly happen to them during this four month period? Now, in the meantime, back on the wreck of the Batavia, um, Cornelius had been there for ten days. Uh, they'd been told, stay there, someone will come back for you, but no one had. Uh, no one, he had no idea what was going on. He had seen this longboat crammed with, with the most senior men in, in the expedition go off across the horizon. Right. I mean, again, as I was saying, what's he going to be thinking? He's going to be like watching everybody leave, and he's like, well, well, um, uh, excuse me, um, hey, what about us? What about us over here? And then he gets to watch them sail away. And not come back again. They were stuck on this wreck for 10 days with waves crashing over. 
They had very little food, very little water, very little sleep. And then finally on the 10th day, a wave crashed over the vessel and broke up the Batavia. And those Oops. 70 men on board were flung into the ocean and, and immediately 30 drowned because back in those days, seamen didn't really know how to swim. Uh, Cornelius and 40 of Thus the low birth rate. The seamen didn't know how to swim. Uh, but <laughs> anyway, so yeah, you're down to 40 people in, <laughs> on the ship now. It's like, oops, the it breaks up on the rocks, the waves dash it, and then boom, 30 of your 70 people go. <laughs> Leafy, Fifi, Foo says, Rrr. yeah, sorry, I'm 12. I'm, I'm like 12 years old up here. If the men were able to grab hold of some wreckage and make their way over to Beacon Island. Um, to safety. Now, when he arrived on Beacon Island, the place was an absolute mess. There was no organization whatsoever. The people on the island were, were distraught. They were upset that their most senior men had deserted them and yeah. gone off in the longboat and no one was, was there looking after them. So when Cornelius arrived, initially they were very, very happy to see him. And he took charge, which was his right. He was the most senior person. And he Yeah, and, and remember. Uh, this is a religious zealot who is hearing the voice of God tell him what to do. So even though it is his right to take command of, the, of this group, to be the leader of the group, uh, he's taking his orders from God. And Flux says, go get the treasure, and if you find people too cool, but find the treasure. Precisely. Precisely exactly that. He started getting things organized. He, uh, he organized for fishing parties to go out and try and catch fish. He organized for all the food to be collected and brought into a central location and put under guard. He organized for all the, the weapons to be brought and stored into his tent, once again under guard. And he organized where things like the latrines were going to be dug, so it was much more sanitary than, than what had been going on. So people were very happy to see him. But he could also see that there was no way that the, the supplies that they had were going to sustain this many people until a rescue vessel came back, if a rescue vessel came back. So he knew he had to do something if he was going to survive. So he called the, the 40 men together that uh, had been mm -hmm. part of the original mutiny that was still alive. He called, uh, he also recruited some people on the, that had part of those 70 men had been on the wreck of the Batavia and he called them together and uh, he said to them, uh, what we need to do is, if we're going to survive until the rescue vessel comes, we have to cull some of the people that are on this island. And uh, once <laughs> the rescue vessel does come, we can attack. Wait. <laughs> How many of you just went, this is a nice story. This is really cool. Well, that's like a really great guy. He's doing, wait, what? How many of you just, How many of you just did a timeout right there? How how many of you how many of you picked up on that? Just like oh, let's listen to this great guy. Do he's getting everything organized. He's fishing, doing fishing expeditions. He's getting things. But whoa, time out. What? <laughs> Together, and uh, he said to them, uh, "What we need to do is, if we're going to survive until the if we're going to survive rescue vessel comes, we have to cull some of the we have to cull some of the survivors." We got to kill people so we have enough food and are able to survive. We've got to cull them as if they're cattle. Exactly, Chris. Wait, what? <laughs> At Legal Vice's record scratch. Uh, so now we're starting to get into it. You know, he's, he's got some ideas going through his head. We need to cull people. Uh, right. <laughs> and who does he call to do this? The people that he was involved in the, uh, in the plot to commit mutiny with. If we're going to survive until the rescue vessel comes, we have to cull some of the people that are on this island. And uh, once a rescue vessel does come, we can attack it, we can take it, and we'll sail off to the Caribbean. So over mm -hmm. the next couple of weeks, strange things started happening. Uh, three men might go off in a fishing party, but only two would return. Um, dun, dun, people dun. heard during the night screams and the sounds of scuffles 
on parts of the island. And when dawn broke, those people, those people who had been sleeping in that location were no longer there. They disappeared suddenly. Right. But it still wasn't fast enough for Cornelius. <laughs> we're, we're not murdering people quickly enough. Oh, my God. Yes. Um. <clears throat> They're just not murdering people quickly enough. We got to pick up the pace a little bit here. Uh, yeah, why kill? Nibble on the hoof keeps meat fresher. <laughs> oh, Lord. Yep. All right. So, what can we do now? And mind you, the, the, the rescue ship is on its way there and this this didn't take long i mean it's, it's not like they're like oh my lord we're starving to death this is some forward planning here it's like oh this is how much food we have this is how many people we have um let's not wait till we're hungry and starving let's start now so we never get hungry and don't starve so he called these men together and he said, you see those people in the hospital tent? There were 16 people in the hospital tent. Um, they're taking up resources. They're not contributing at all. Um, go and do something about it. So his men descended upon the hospital tent and massacred everyone in that, that tent. And we're now, off to the races. There was a man on board the ship, a preacher by the name of Bastanez, who was on, had been on his way to Java to open a congregation there. He'd been traveling with his wife and his six daughters. Uh, and he could see what was happening because his wife and five, yeah. five of his daughters had been in that hospital tent and been massacred. Yeah, poor dude. He's, is, is his wife and five of his six daughters are, are taken out from the tent. But as you'll see, that was probably a blessing. That was probably a blessing that his his wife and five daughters were taken in the hospital massacre by these men. He was fearful for his life. He went to Cornelius and he begged for his life. Um, and he said to him, here is my 16-year-old daughter, my only remaining daughter, um, my oldest daughter. Uh, take her and do with her what you will. Uh, Comments? <laughs> and mind you, the rescue ship has only been gone for a, a week or two. This isn't like the end of days yet. This is how quickly they descended into this level of of whatever the fuck this is. You've just killed my wife and five of my daughters. Here, take my last daughter, but don't hurt me. The f <clears throat> I told you this is one of the worst Maritime Monday stories you're ever going to hear. This is probably one of the worst stories of any kind you're ever going to hear. Because you'll notice, we are exactly halfway through this now. That's how bad this story is. We're just gearing up. But spare my life. And Cornelius, I mean, people were very, very devoutly religious back in those days. And, and Cornelius thought that it might be very handy to have someone uh, telling people that he was acting upon the word. So they were Dutch. So they were probably all Calvinists, I would imagine. Uh, all, all, except, except for crazy boss man Cornelius of God and doing God's work so he allowed uh, Bastinez to, to live but he took his 16 year old daughter and he put her in what was known as the pleasure tent with, along with five other women and during that time on the island any man could go into that pleasure tent and he could effectively rape any of the women in that pleasure tent um, over that period but the beautiful Lucretia uh, she was too good for that. So she, she was put into uh, Cornelius' tent because he wanted her 
uh, for himself. Now, uh, yep. I, I got I got nothing. You, you know how hard it is for me to be struck speechless. Um, yeah, and that's just from what we've heard so far. Just wait. <laughs> just wait. Bass says, Paul, sit on boring Beacon Island and starve or ride on overcrowded small boat. Well, <laughs> I guess we all know which one we'd choose at this point, right? Now, over the next few weeks, uh, it, things became more and more obvious, and terror reigned on Beacon Island. If you look sideways at one of uh, Cornelius's men, they could attack you and they could murder you. Uh, any sort of opposition, anyone said anything, uh, you, could be, you could be killed. And over a period of time, many people were. Some people were able to escape over to what was known as Long Island. Um, what had happened originally when they arrived at, um, on the island, the... Um, when he could see that there was too many people on the island, uh, Cornelius ordered that 50 people be taken over to what's called Seal Island here, but what they called Long Island. Um, he told them that there's not enough living space here. You go over to Long Island and we'll bring food and water over to you each day. <laughs> but he had no intention of ever doing that. Um, <laughs> he, um, he wanted them to no. die of starvation or exposure. So he didn't resupply them at all. He also no. sent a group of men over to West Wallaby Island. These were VOC soldiers, and they were under the command of a man by the name of Weeby Hayes. All right. Now, now we've got to remember I said we're going to have to draw a map of where everybody is at this point. Hey, dog. Buggy. Come here, puppers. Stop licking each other's ears, damn it. All right. We've got Beacon Island. That's where... That's where the main group of people are. We've got the other guys in the boat, the, the 40 people in the boat uh, going for the rescue. A couple of them have died since then, being you know, from punishment. Uh, and they're still on their way, though, as far as I understand. Either that or they've just recently arrived in Batavia. Uh, now, he sent people from Beacon Island over here to Seal Island. Promising that <laughs> he'll bring them food and water every day. I pinky swear. I'll bring you. I'll I'll bring you some food. And then he sends the military over here to West Wallaby Island. Uh, yeah, get the people with the guns as far away from you as possible. Uh, yeah, we we want the people that are still loyal to the uh, East India Company, the Dutch East India Company, with all the guns. Uh, the military folks as far away as possible. So he sends them over to West Wallaby Island. So now we've got four groups of people. Those in the rescue boat, quote unquote, the West Wallaby folks, the Seal Island folks, and the Beacon Island folks. Uh. Yes, we're going to be talking about the Weeby Hayes Stone Fort here in, uh, at the end of the show. You see soldiers. And they were under the command of a man by the name of Weeby Hayes. Now, Hayes was just an ordinary soldier. He was 20 years old, that's all. Uh, he had absolutely no rank at all, but he had distinguished himself during the evacuation of Batavia. Uh, he had no rank, but no, he no had one's on Dick what Island. was known as command presence or natural leadership ability. And even though all the VOC officers had gone, so the other VOC soldiers looked up to Weeby Hayes uh, to command them. And he was seen as a threat to Cornelius. So Cornelius ordered him to go over to West Wallaby Island with 15 of his men, search the island, and uh, once they'd searched the island, send up a smoke signal and we'll come back and get you. We'll come and pick you up. But once again, he had no intention at all of picking up these men. They were going to go to that island to die. <laughs> but once these, the mutinies really started being an open affair and people escaped over to Long Island and warned the people over there, um, Long Island became a bit of a frustration to Cornelius. He had sent these people over to die, but they hadn't. Some of them hadn't. You could see them walking along the beach. They had been able to collect shellfish and um, 
and eat grass. And they had actually rained a few times, so they were able to collect the water. And even Yay. though they were in terrible condition, they were still alive. Yay. So Cornelius decided to do something about it, and he sent his men over to Long Island to massacre the people on that island. And okay. They, they massacred almost 50 people, but some of them were able to escape and make their way over to West Wallaby Island again. <laughs> oh, my God. All right, so now what we've, what we've got here is the, the people they sent over to Long Island to die, they're just not dying fast enough. Damn it, the rain. It, oh, they're getting shellfish. Holy crap, those people, they're not supposed to be able to live over there. Uh, they're not dying fast enough again. So let's go just let's go take them out. Let's go massacre them. And then some of them escape. So we freed up some space now. <laughs> we freed up some space. Cornelius is is a, he's freeing up space. We've got the guys in the rescue boat. We've got the guys on Beacon Island. Now we've just cleared off Long Island. So you know, don't worry about that. And uh, those people are now over there on uh, on West Wallaby. Oh, dear. Now, when they got to West Wallaby Island, they were able to warn Weeby Hayes and his men what was going on. Yeah, they, they've only been fooled twice. <laughs> they've only been fooled twice. Once that everything's going to be okay on Beacon Island. Once, oh, we promise, go over to Seal Island, we'll take care of you. And now that they got over there, they're like, yeah, don't trust this guy. He's up to no good. <laughs> don't don't do anything. Don't do anything he says. They were, had been confused. They'd gone on, to, they'd searched the island, and they actually had found uh, food and water. There was a spring on the island, a freshwater spring. It was only small, but it was was very handy. And there was also food uh, in what they called in their diaries jumping cats, but we now know them as rock wallabies. And these things were so tame, you could walk up to them, you could grab them, Aww. and you could kill them, and they had a, a good supply of meat. So the soldiers on West Wallaby Island were in pretty good condition. But once they'd been warned about what was happening on Beacon Island, they knew that they were going to be next, and they knew about the, the massacre on Long Island. They knew that their turn was coming. So Weeby Hayes and his men built this fort made of rocks and sandstone on the island, and they started preparing themselves. They got... Uh, now we're gonna we're gonna read a little bit. We're gonna we're gonna watch another short video about this particular fort later. Very very interesting history. Well, I mean, well, this is the history, but I mean, it, it has historical significance. So we'll we'll be we'll be addressing this uh, right at the end. Pieces of wood. They put um, uh, they tied rocks to the end of it to make clubs. They um, they made slingshots. A water barrel had washed up onto the beach, and they were able to get the iron ring that uh, surrounded that water barrel and sharpen it up and make knives and spears out of the, the, uh, the iron from that. And so they were preparing themselves uh, for an attack. Now, the people on West Wallaby Island were concerned to uh, Cornelius by this stage. He knew that if a, a rescue vessel was going to come, it was probably going to come from the north, and that the people on West Wallaby would be in a far better position to warn them um, of, warn that ship what was going on. So he knew something had to be done. So he sent a delegation over to see Weeby Hayes and say, well, why don't you come and join us? And when a ship arrives, we will take that ship and we'll sail off to the Caribbean. And Hayes refused. He was loyal to the VOC. He said, no, we're not going to do that. Uh, and he prepared for an attack. And this is where the, um, the fort is actually on West Wallaby Island. You can see it there. And it's not really clear here, but this is the coastline along here. Um, this is at low tide. So in uh, late July of that year, 1629, the very first attack on the island happened, and two boatloads of the mutineers, armed to the teeth, were heading to the island. They didn't expect any trouble because they knew the men over here were not armed at all, um, so, and they'd already yeah. taken part in the massacre of Long Island, which was a very easy thing to do. So they, they were thinking this was going to be very easy. But when the first boat hit the beach, Weeby Hayes and his men rushed out from their fort uh, and grabbed the men as they were trying to make their way out of the boat. They killed several of them. They were able to capture their weapons and fire on the second boat that was coming into shore. And they had that second vessel had to retreat and get away. 
So Weeby Hayes was able to capture some of the arms and ammunition mm -hmm. that had been on the first boat. And they were able to carry that, that boat up to the... Now, this is, the, this is sort of the beginning of the, uh, of the fight back. Uh, the, 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 the beginning of the will to survive. Northern part of West Wallaby Island and hide it there amongst the scrub um, because they also knew that if a ship was going to come, it was probably going to come from the north. And over the next few weeks, there were several more attacks on the, um, on the island staged by Cornelius and his men. And in fact, in one of those attacks, Cornelius and five men were captured by Weeby Hayes and his men. Um, the five men were immediately executed by Hayes, but uh, Cornelius was kept mm -hmm. alive as a bargaining. Now, we'll get into a little bit about these executions. Because, uh, yeah, they're pretty, pretty brutal. Just in case. But that meant that the command of the mutineers or the, the men of Beacon Island went to a man by the name of Walter Luz, who was a VOC soldier. He had had previous battlefield experience, so he was going to attack a lot differently than, we be, than um, uh, Cornelius had. And the final attack on the island took place on the 17th of September. And what they did is that in groups of twos, they surrounded the fort that Weeby Hayes and his men were in, and they, as one fired, the other one reloaded uh, in these, these uh, positions around the fort. And if Weeby Hayes and his men tried to rush out and attack one of those pairs, they'd be fired upon from all directions from the other pairs that were around the fort. And over a period of hours, several of Weeby's men were dead or wounded in the fort, and things were absolutely desperate. There was no chance that they could surrender and, and go to the mercy of the, the mutineers because there was not going to be any mercy at all. They knew that. They knew that if, if they were taken, they were dead. So they had to fight to the last man. And that was coming very, very soon. Uh, things were absolutely desperate in that fort. And just in the um, tradition of a great Western movie, just as the, the last uh, round of ammunition was going to be fired, the, uh, the cavalry arrived on the horizon in form of a sail. And at last it was Pelsart aboard the Sargon. Mm -hmm. He had taken 63 days to get back to um, the wreck of the Batavia, even though the first vessel had only, the longboat had only taken 30 days. 30 now, so again, just, just as they're ready to delete each other, just as they're just ready to, to pull the plug, everybody's going to kill everybody else, then the rescuers are coming. The ones who were there to rescue the survivors. <coughs> the, the ones who were there to find the treasure. And maybe if they can be bothered to uh, pick up a couple survivors. Three days. Um, because he didn't have anyone experienced enough to take them back to the island. So as soon as they saw the sail, a, a great race started. Uh, Walter Luz and his men rushed to their boats and they tried to get out to the, the Sargon to take the vessel. Weeby <laughs> Hayes and his men rushed to the north of West Wallaby Island. They jumped in their vessel, their boat, and they tried to, to, to row out to the Sargon to warn them what was going on. And just because they were in much better physical condition... So, I mean, Jeebus! The, the guys literally... The guys are literally coming to save your ass, and your first thought is, let's go take over that ship. How feral had these people gotten by that point? They're like, oh, this, this ship full of really healthy, healthy people that are coming to save us with let's attack and take over the ship. But you know, bless the uh, bless the remaining soldiers for trying to get out there and warn them of the fuckery that's going on. Condition than than um, the men on uh, then uh, Walter Luz's men, Weeby Hayes's men, made it to the, the Sargon before uh, first. And they were able to warn Pelsart what was going on. So when Walter Luz and his men arrived, they were staring up at a, a range of muskets and they were all taken prisoner. Now, there's some historical firsts in all this story. This was Australia's mm -hmm. very first and still most deadly mass murder of all time. The, um, the fort that Weeby Hayes and his men built on West Welby Island is the very first European structure ever built on Australian soil. 
So yeah, and I said we're gonna we're gonna watch a uh, we're gonna watch a very short video from the National Film and Sound Archive of Australia about that that fort here at, at the end of the show. The um, the very first official structure ever built on Australian soil isn't a uh, a fort. It isn't a church. It isn't a uh, not even a tavern. It was actually the gallows that were used to hang uh, Cornelius and eight of his co-conspirators. But um, they weren't just hung. Before they were hung, they... Yeah, this is great. This is sort of, sort of where we kind of get into, uh, into some of the... There's other stories. There's other videos that go into greater detail on this particular aspect, but... Co-conspirators. But um, they weren't just hung. Before they were hung, they had their hands chopped off and not chopped off with a, an axe or a, a sword or something like that, a nice clean cut. They were hacked off with a hammer and chisel. Uh, yeah, so, I mean, that's... I mean, you, you, can, you can kill them, uh, sure. But uh, why, why not chop off their hands, their mutinous hands first, and then with a chisel? Their hands were chiseled off of their bodies. I mean, perhaps you would say that they deserved it. Uh, but yeah, so it's like, don't, don't die before we kill you, because that would take all the fun out of it. They had their hands chiseled off with a hammer and chisel, and then they were hung, but... Uh, several times to get through to, to, to mm. um, uh, amputate that wrist. And... It wasn't just because of the torture involved in hacking off their wrists that they did this, because these weren't the sort of gallows where you fell through a trap door, you came to a sudden stop, your neck was broken and you died instantly. These were the sort of gallows where you were strung up by the neck and you could take five, six, seven minutes to finally asphyxiate and die. And uh, if you felt pressure on your neck during that time, I mean, the first thing you did was raise your hands up to try and relieve that pressure. If you haven't got it, yeah. <laughs> yeah, see, they're thinking these things through. They're thinking this through. <laughs> it's going to be a long, slow, painful death. And uh, reports are that some of them didn't asphyxiate quickly. There's reports that some of them lasted for hours. Hours. So they chop off their hands. Why? So they can't reach up and try to save themselves. They can't try to pull on the rope. They can't try to reach the gallows. They chopped off their hands so they could they had, could grab onto nothing to save themselves. Holy crap. Uh, yeah. That's using the old executor's noggin, isn't it? any hands it's seen as more psychological torture for the person being hung and it was also seen as great entertainment for the people watching on as well okay there's your answer right there well uh, this is forward planning they need it before they got into this mess uh sovereign bosman asks well legal vices wouldn't it be way easier to bind their hands yes it would be way easier to bind your hands but as the the question was just answered. One, it's psychological torture, and two, oh, don't don't buffer. Please don't buffer. If you haven't got any hands, it's seen as more psychological torture for and? the person being hung. And it was also seen as great entertainment for the people watching on as well. <laughs> yeah, they could bind their hands, but it just wouldn't be as fun for the people that were watching. So there, there's your answer. It's just not as much fun to the viewers if you just tie their hands behind their back. Come on now, you're not playing along. Now, another historical first is that there was two men on the... You haven't passed out, have you? Oh, I thought I had one. Oh, gee. Oh, I thought I had one. Um, damn. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I got the lectures. He's, he's sad that no one passed out. <laughs> damn, almost had one. Um, there was two men aboard the Sargon as they were traveling back to, um, to the city of Batavia who some of the crew felt some sympathy for. 
Now, the first one of these was Walter Luz, the man that had taken command after Cornelius had been captured. Um, he was a fairly honourable man, it seems. He, um, he had not taken part in the mutiny. He hadn't taken part in the rapes in the pleasure tent. Um, his defence was the Nuremberg defence. I mean, I was following orders. Uh, Cornelius was the most senior person on the island. He was in charge. I was following his orders. I had to do what he told me to do. And there was some sympathy for this defence. Now, there was also another man on board, a 13-year-old cabin boy by the name of Jan Pelgrim. Um, he had been involved in the mutiny. He had taken part in the rapes in the pleasure tent, but he was only 13 years old. And it was felt that he had been influenced by the older, more experienced people and that mm. perhaps he was a good kid. Now, Pelsart was deadly afraid of another mutiny aboard the Sargon. He couldn't have anyone on board that uh, had sympathy towards them. So, he so I mean, that's a that's a reasonable that's a reasonable fear. Uh, where you 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 discovered only after the ship had been wrecked that someone and a group of someone's were planning to mutiny to dis to take out you and to steal your ship. So it's reasonable that those people that may have been influenced by those that were around you, uh, you it's reasonable to sort of. Be a little bit wary of them as you're as you're returning home. He cast them away ashore on the Australian mainland, and they became the very first European residents of us of the Australian mainland. And so, uh, how interesting is that? We don't trust you, so just go live here in Australia. And boom, it is believed the first permanent landing of white man in Australia was recorded here at the mouth of the uh, Witakara Creek. They they were Wooterloos and Jan Pelgrim cast away by Commander Francisco Pelsert after the wreck of the Dutch East India Trade Com India trading vessel Batavia, uh, where are we at here? Boop, which ran aground on the northern group of the Aberholes Aberholos Islands in the year 1629 A.D. There you go. They're in Australia. And no one knows what really sent them away ashore on the Australian mainland. And they became the very first European residents of, us, of the Australian mainland. And no one knows what really happened to them. But um, decades later, another Dutch party came across a group of Aboriginals. And one of the men had blonde hair and blue eyes. And his name was Jan. And there was speculation hmm. about could this be a descendant of Jan Pelgrim. Oh, well, I don't know. There's a good possibility. And uh, Elliot Morin, Jakarta used to be Batavia. Yep, that's the whole purpose for this ship. I assume you're, you've are you either joined late or are watching from the beginning. But yes, that's why this ship is called the Batavia because it, that was one of its main, it was going to be one of its main trading routes was Batavia, which later became Jakarta. We don't know. Now, the um, one of the things that was recovered that, there was um, 10 chests of silver, 10 of the 12 chests of silver were recovered. So Pelsart um, was able to complete the, the important part of his mission, which was <laughs> rescuing that treasure. So they only lost two chests of treasure. Congratulations. But they did, they did get that fourth century AD beautiful cameo. God, I mean, I, that's probably worth an unfathomable amount of money. And also recovered was this priceless um, brooch, which is now called the Gemma Constantina Batavia uh, brooch, uh, cameo. And it's on display at the Rijks Museum in, uh, in Amsterdam. And it was found in the possessions of Lucretia van den Mylen, Mylen in Cornelius's it tent. It was hidden Lucretius away amongst took it. her possessions. Of course it was. So the Batavia arrived back in the, sorry, the, um, the Sargon arrived back in the city of Batavia on the 5th of December, 1629. And immediately, all the other remaining mutineers were taken out and hung, all except for one man. See, wouldn't that suck? <laughs> wouldn't that suck? You go through all of this just to, just to go, oh, back to civilization. Ah, crap, they're going to hang all of us. So they, rather than just kill them and, and take them back and, and not worry about taking them back, they wanted to make sure they took them back and killed them there in Batavia. 
So, <laughs> I think that, that's great. It's sort of like you, when someone's on death row in America and they try to kill themselves, it's like, ah, bring them back to life so we can execute them. Don't let them go out this way. That's They can't die that way. We have to execute them. So, yeah, they uh, they they kept the they put the people that they couldn't trust, the ones that they that may not have directly participated in, that they could just couldn't trust enough to stay on the ship. They put those off on the Australian mainland. The other ones, they kept them there. They could have put them all off on the Australian mainland, but no, 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 they ain't gonna take these guys back because they've got to face punishment. So they just got off the ship and immediately rounded the them all up. Remaining mutineers were taken and out did away and with hung. Them. All except, All except one. one. The VOC decided that this sort of behavior, this sort of mutiny on board one of their vessels could not be tolerated. They had to set an example. So they decided to subject one person to the most. Now, as, as punishments go, this is a particularly nasty, nasty, freaking brutal way to go. Uh, this guy, unfortunately, lost the execution lottery. Uh, <laughs> stand back for this one. Stand, stand by for torturous news. Listen to this death. Taken out right. and hung, all except for one man. The VOC decided that this sort of behavior, this sort of mutiny on board one of their vessels, could not be tolerated. They had to set an example. So they decided to subject one person to the most horrendous torture that they could conceive at the, the time. And that was to be broken on the wheel. So this man was selected. He was <sighs> to be broken on the wheel. That is a very, very unpleasant way to go. There, there are two ways it can be done. Um, but th this is one way. He was taken out into a courtyard in the city of Batavia, strapped to this wheel, and then they took iron bars, and starting with his fingers and his toes, they proceeded to pulverize virtually every bone in his body. And they left him on this wheel for several days without food or water until he died. And now, the, the, the two ways they would do this, one was, was as we see here in the picture, strapping them up backwards on this wheel and just 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 literally pulverizing them. I can't do the goat scream because this volume is low and my volume is low and everybody's earphones are up. And if I do the goat noise, everyone with in-ear earphones will instantly go deaf. Uh, <laughs> but just in your head, play the goat screaming. But yeah, that was one way to do them up backwards like that and then literally start at their fingers and toes and smash every bone in their body keeping them alive during all of this. The other way was just to strap them spread eagle to a wheel, like the front side of the wheel, and just do the same thing. But, yeah. There you go. You're, you're a mutinous, murdering, grapey. And the one thing this video doesn't mention is the cannibalism. Uh, yeah, there was some of that going on too. <laughs> Not only were they were they just culling the people, um, they were attacking and munching on them as well, reports have it. So yeah, that's where the cannibalism comes in. These guys don't mention it in this lecture, but there there was reported cannibalism that went on with the with the uh the powers that be. You know, just taking a little munch. But yeah, ah, uh, can you imagine how, no, you can't imagine how bad that hurt. Your mind wouldn't allow you to imagine how badly that hurt. Uh, uh, yep, there we go. Strap them to a wheel and start crushing bones with iron bars, mallets, whatever. And at any time during that period, Anyone could come into the um, into the courtyard and they could turn that wheel. Great friend, great front. <laughs> so there you go. People are like, "What? No wheel turning? There's your wheel turning. I was waiting for that." 
Oh, Christ, can you imagine if that was the way you were going, strapped to the turning part of the wheel? You have all of your fingers, toes, wrists, ankles, shins, knees, forearms. I mean, just all of these bones shattered. And then someone just comes along and goes, and rotates you. Ah! Just rotates you back around. Oh, God. See, now, if this was the punishment today for rapey behavior, this might actually be a deterrent. Yeesh. And mind you, this wasn't for the, uh, the, the murders and the grapey behavior. This was because they mutinied the ship. And for all the family. And um, anyone yep. could come into the, um, into the courtyard and they could turn that wheel. Great fun, great fun for all the family. And um, can you imagine the pain of huh. all those dozens of broken bones turning at the Just one time? Grinding against each other. Uh. Bastin is the preacher. Uh, he had supported yeah. Cornelius all throughout this. He told people that Cornelius was doing God's work. The, uh, the church uh, held an inquiry into his behavior, which lasted for more than a month. Um, during that time, mainly for political reasons, he was eventually acquitted of any wrongdoing. Now, mm. as soon as he's, the day after, he was acquitted, mm. his daughter found out about it, the daughter that had been subjected to all these rapes dozens of times in the pleasure tent, when she found out that her father had been acquitted by the church, she took her own life. That See, and that's the wrong way to do it. Take out that son of a bitch. That's what you should have done, young lady. Should have taken out that son of a bitch. Your, your dear old pa. Bastanez tried to start a congregation in, uh, uh. in Java, but because of his reputation, no one would come to his church. So he eventually yeah. returned back to uh, the Netherlands. Lucretia van den Milen, Whatever happened beauty. to her? Um, her husband, her diamond merchant husband, had died uh, while she was en route to Batavia. So she really had no support. She was accused of, by the other survivors of uh, being a, a co-conspirator in what had happened. Well, of course uh, she, she was. initially been taken to Cornelius's tent, probably against her will, but it seems that over a period of time, she'd come around to his thinking. And um, the other survivors said that at best, she was indifferent to their suffering, but at worst, she encouraged him in some of his heinous acts. And she was put on trial. She pleaded not guilty. The, um, the court applied to have her tortured, which was the standard sort of thing that you did during that time so you could find <laughs> out the truth. <laughs> yeah, it's in re you know, look at the times there. That's, that was literally the, you know, Monty Python and the Holy Grail thing. <laughs> How do we know she's a witch? Burn her, throw her into the pond. Does she weigh the same as a duck? Uh, you know, that that was just the trial by torture. Uh, you know, gee, I'm so glad some things have changed in the legal world. But again, this is what, I mean, because you know, all of the horrible things that happened during the Salem witch trials in, in the States, you know, the where they would like do the old, well, let's find out if she's a witch. Let's dunk her in the water for an undue number amount of time. And if she's alive after 15 minutes underwater, she's a witch. If she dies during that 10, I guess she wasn't a witch and she was innocent and her soul will go to heaven. Or, you know, death by pressing where they just start piling rocks on top of you one at a time. Uh, and if you, you know, if if you're if you're a a a, a saint and you know, God will save you, but if you're if you're crushed to death, you must have been a witch. Uh, that sort of thing. Now remember, all of that Salem witch trial stuff happened in 1692, sixty years after this. So imagine how refined the torturers of the Salem witch trials felt compared to whatever brutality that was being foisted on people 60 years before them during you know, this kind of trial by torture. Yep, that's what I just said, the death by pressing. <laughs> uh, 
Yeah, so the uh, just imagine how bad it was 60 years before all those new refined ways of torturing people of 1692. Um, but because of her great beauty, her reputation for great beauty, that, uh, that permission was denied, and she was eventually um, <laughs> uh, found not guilty and freed. Now, her, like I said... I See, they even had privilege back then. They, they even had beauty privilege back then. Husband had died... She, her reputation was destroyed as well during this trial, and uh, she couldn't find anyone else of a, of a higher level to marry. She eventually married a yeah. lowly VOC soldier, and she returned to the Netherlands as well and was never heard from again. Pelsart, the senior merchant. Yeah, the Pelsart, VOC whatever happened an inquiry, and they found that he was at least partially responsible for what had happened during this voyage. He hadn't had enough control over the voyage. So they decided to punish him but not physically. In the true tradition of the VOC, where profit was above everything else, they stripped him of all his assets, his houses, his bank accounts, uh, everything he owned, and they turned him out onto the streets with just the clothes on his back, and he died in the city of Batavia, destitute, as a, he died from starvation. The only person that came out of... Death by lost profits. <laughs> Again, isn't that the ultimate Ferengi thing to do? That's the ultimate Dutch East India Company punishment. Now, we could kill you, but that's too good for you. We're going to bankrupt you and let you starve to death in the street with no money. So this Weeby. Well, it all was Weeby Hayes. He became a national hero in the Netherlands. He was promoted to captain. His uh, salary was increased fivefold. There's statues of Weeby Hayes all over the Netherlands. There's one in Geraldton, Good on him. In Western Australia. He, like I said, a national hero and did very, very well for himself. Good for him. So of the original 331 people that um, uh, boarded the Batavia for its maiden voyage, a year after the sergeant arrived with the survivors in the city of, Bat of Batavia, only 68 were still alive. The rest yeah, those, those are not good numbers. <laughs> Yeah, that's, those are really bad survival odds. ...to succumb uh, during that voyage. Now, a lot of, there's been a lot of archaeological digs on the islands, um, uh, Long Island, Beacon Island, and it seems that a rich, you know, in the first few, few days, weeks, um, the dead were pre treated very honorably. You know, graves were dug, people were put into graves uh, in rows, and treated with respect. Um, but over a period of time, uh, people were just dug um, ditches. We keep going? Yeah. We just dug ditches and thrown into ditches. Um, in the Shipwreck Museum in Fremantle, there's a wonderful display of the Batavia. I think some of you went to it the other day. Yeah, so what they've done is they have they found, and I believe it was in the uh, 1960s, they found the wreck of the Batavia, and they raised the wreck, and they put it in the museum day and, and should have enjoyed that and Lee and I were cruising around on our boat in the Netherlands a few couple of years ago and we went to Batavia land in the Netherlands which is um, <laughs> a, a strange place but they've got a full Batavia size land. replica of the Bat <laughs> I wonder if, it, if it's like uh, if it's like medieval times in America where you, you, you do the stupid thing where you watch the jousting going on while you, you eat medieval style eat a whole chicken with your hands while you drink Dr. Pepper or Coke or whatever. I wonder if it's like that. They just like serve you like food that is sort of shaped like a human arm or something like that <laughs> in Batavia land. Batavia, which is a fantastic ship to go and visit. They've also got um, um, craftsmen there who hand make the, um, the headboards and things that uh, on the, and there's a smithy shop which makes nails. You can make your own ropes and things. Um, now, I was talking before about those ropes on the front of the ship. One of the interesting things we found was that when we got a tour of the, the actual replica of the Batavia, they took us up to the bow of the ship, and there's uh, some holes at the, at the bow, where, and these are the heads or the toilets, and you sit on these, these holes uh, and do your business, and then you haul up one of those ropes that's beside the, the toilet, and the end of that rope is frayed. It's about a metre long, and it's all frayed. And to clean yourself, you put that rope between your legs mm. and you mm. clean yourself and then you put the rope back in the water and the motion of the, of the ship cleans that rope. 
There's a little insight into uh, 1600s hygiene, isn't it? Hmm. See, those are things you never thought about, did you? How do you clean your bum on a ship in the 1600s? Well, now you know. Now you know. Now, if we don't... <laughs> Isabella Rennie says, wait, you wipe yourself with a rope? I was hoping my English was failed me. <laughs> no, your English was perfect. Yep. That's a shitty rope. Don't get to um, South Africa in time. If you, if you come out onto your balcony one day and you see a rope hanging from the rail in your balcony, you'll know exactly what to do now. But, um, but we're on deck four, so please be careful when you're throwing the rope back because we, <laughs> we don't want to be sitting out there having a lovely coffee and... Oh. Um, <laughs> Russell Crowe has purchased the film rights to this story, so hopefully... The now, seriously, wouldn't that make a hell of a movie? This would make... This story would literally make one hell of a good movie. I hope, I hope it gets made. Russell Crowe, if you never do anything else in your entire career ever, ever again, make this movie. There'll be a movie in the making uh, in the near future. Um, but uh, as I said, that's the story of the the mutiny of the Batavia. I hope you've enjoyed it. I'm back in a couple of days' time, and I'm going to be telling you all about the man that's considered to be the world's greatest living adventurer. So you've got some homework to do now. You all right, that's that's the end of this of this particular video. And again, it's uh, retired afloat is the channel this came from. Uh, I was just looking right now. They, he's got a. 925 subscribers. Uh, so he's picked up, I guess, like 60, 70 subscribers since we started. Thank you all for showing that support. The links are down there below. It's a small channel run by a retired Australian and his wife. They're, they're a retired couple. They've got a boat. They sail around uh, you know, Europe. And then when it gets cold, they uh, take cruises around the rest of the world. Uh, support their channel. This is an amazing video, There's, and I really, really want to do an interview with this guy because I love his presentation. I love the way he presents this. And there's other other videos that, you know, if if it let me, I'll use. I would love to use, and I would love to do like what we did with brick and mortar, and have him on and go through one of these together. I think that would be an awesome story to tell. Maybe the uh, Northwest Passage story. You know, th that that might be a great one, but. If you, if you can, if you're so inclined, if you want to hear some more of these stories, look at some other guy's sailing life and uh, how he enjoys his retirement. Uh, like I said, there's, very, there's only a few videos there now, but there's some very, very good ones. The Contiki Expedition, um, some America's Cup videos, Circumnavigating the World, Ghost Ships, uh, the Batavia, the Shackleton. Um, you, the, he's got an entire video on the Dutch East India Company if you want to learn more about that. Now, the Lost Franklin Expedition, she says, I think that would be a fun video to do with him. The Lost Franklin Expedition is really, really cool, too. Uh, and there's a video about the man who named Australia. And you know, there's, there's some other cool videos here that are just, that are just great. And if, there, if you think you're interested in, please go and subscribe to his channel. It's the uh, Retired Afloat. Great stuff. And like I said, I'm going to try. I've sent him an email already. Because I that's how that's how much I like this video and I and what I've read from his other ones. And uh, so if if we can get him on as a, as a guest, that would be super super awesome. Mutiny on the Bounty isn't based on this story. No, no, the Mutiny on the Bounty was a completely separate story. Yeah, that's that's Captain Cook. Yeah, that's totally something else. Uh, yeah, <laughs> no, that's that's not as bad as this. As far as mutinies go. <laughs> Thank you so much for that super chat. And just me says I've never I'm I'm never bitching about a single ply toilet paper again. Oh come on, frayed rope. That sounds comfortable to me, doesn't it? You've got to try and figure uh, out. Well, hang on there, go away, dude. Thank you so much for uh, seriously special shout out to retired afloat. Like I looked at four or five different videos, some with high production values and whatnot, but. The, the one thing that I tend not to like about these videos is when the people try to do the voiceovers and they get really mysterious or you know, they try to make it 
sound like a, I don't know. It's a scary story. I, I just like it when you, that's why I like brick and mortar because I love his delivery. I love his calm, cool baritone delivery. Um, I like this guy because he, he's, he just gives it to you lecture standard. So I, I really like his, his presentation. He's not, he's not pretentious in his vocals. Shannon seven. Thank you so much. I could have gone all day without learning about this toilet. Your problem with this story is the toilet rope. That's what you could have gone your whole day without. You could have gone your whole day without knowing about the toilet rope, but you're okay with the cannibalism with the crushing every bone in your body is torture, uh, setting up pleasure tents for the women, some preacher guy giving his daughter up, his only surviving daughter up to the crazy leader of the of the uh, horrible people just to save himself, with uh, people being tortured to death for confessions, um, with with mur just culling people just murdering them because you just think there's too many people around sending people off on islands to die you're cool with all of this it's the toilet rope you're having problems with <laughs> okay oh this story now you, you you have you have to see just i mean it's not a funny story at all but oh my god like i i wasn't what do you think? Was I exaggerating when I said this may be the worst story you ever hear in your life? I don't think I was uh, because it's, it literally is just one of the most horrific stories, true stories you're actually going to hear. Uh, I, and I seriously hope this movie gets made. Good times on Beacon Island. <laughs> uh, and I don't know what we're going to do next week. I, I just, I just don't know. I don't, I don't know what can what can there, well, there's nothing's going to top this. I'm not even going to try to top this story. We're just going to have to reboot, do something different next week. Uh, I have I have some ideas, but next week we'll be doing more of the Maritime Monday because that's what we do. And how are we doing here now? Let's do the end of stream grift. We've currently got 604 people. This may be the the largest Maritime Monday crowd we've ever had. Like I said, ordinarily, this is this is our second smallest thing. And then Thursday, when we do the O.J. Simpson trial, that's usually our smallest by a, by a small margin. Uh, but this is usually a very, very close second to the slowest stream of the week. But, hey, I mean, the, the 600 of you that are watching now, that is super awesome. I'm so glad you stuck through this, this horrific story with us. Oh, my gosh. So what have we got coming up this week? Tomorrow, unless something else happens, uh, there, there are a couple of things. I've got a couple of irons in the fire that I'm working on. If none of that pans out this week, what we'll be doing Tuesday and Wednesday, so tomorrow and the next day, we'll be watching uh, the, cri the, cr the crime scene reenactment guy who is a witness for the prosecution in the Murdoch trial. He just gave the most absurd testimony I've ever heard in my life. We started it a couple of days ago. But we it was just to fill a gap until something else started. But we'll go back, and I want to watch that. It'll probably take two days, one day for the direct examination, one day for the cross-examination uh, to do that. I can cram it all into one day if I have to, if this other thing I'm trying to do pans out. But if that doesn't pan out, Tuesday and Wednesday will be cross-examination of the Murdoch trial. Uh, Thursday will be O.J. Simpson Day. And Friday, Friday is going to be the background information for a new trial starting Monday. Something that is way, way cooler than the Murdoch trial. Those of you that watch the Murdoch trial are going to give up on the Murdoch trial and come and watch me starting next week. Uh, we got that. We got that underway. We're going to put that into action probably Friday. All right. <laughs> Shannon's coming to the defense. I, I never said that. Well, you said you could have gone the whole day without hearing the toilet rope thing. You didn't mention anything else horrific you heard. Um, so we'll, assuming this this trial is still up in the air, uh, assuming it goes forward, we'll give the background information on Friday. It's, it is seriously a trial that you won't want to miss. So we'll talk about that later, when and if that happens. Uh, that's what's coming up. And next Monday, we'll be back with more with uh, more Maritime Monday. And I'm not sure how the weekend plan is, is going to kick out, but uh, 
I had really, really a lot of fun yesterday doing just an impromptu uh, stream yesterday for what would be to go five hours, something like that. I can't, even, I don't even know how long we went, but we had a lot of fun with Steve Gosney, Andrew Bronca, uh, Steph, the alter nerd joined us, Ian Runkle, Runkle from the Bailey and Chris Mullen, our newest member. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you to Chris Mullen being the newest member who has signed up for the clean and sober crew. Deeply, deeply appreciated. If you haven't hit that like button, please do. And if you haven't subscribed, I would, I would appreciate it if you would subscribe to me and hang with me as we go through these, doing what we do. Um, let me, I, and if, if you have subscribed, please make sure you're still subscribed. Let me see how we've done today. Oh, we've picked up six subscribers. Well, that's nice. Thank you to the six subscribers we picked up. Hopefully there's more. Um, and now we need to stop the like and subscribe poll. So if you have hit the like button and have made sure you're subscribed, then uh, let's see how we did on the poll. Coming in at fourth place with 14% of the vote, I bet you wish you would have voted at the end of this. <laughs> at the end, end of this, 14% of you said you clicked the like and subscribe button like smashing bones on the wheel. Now that you know what it means, you probably wish you would have selected. Oh, there's a tie for, for second and third place with both have 28% of the vote. You click the like and subscribe button like a mutineer stabbing a survivor and like chewing on a fellow passenger, but coming in with in first place with just a 2% lead at 30% of the vote, I click the like and subscribe button like a ship crashing on the rocks. So that's the end of the poll for today. Thank you so much for taking it. As always, I'm starting to love these polls. Thank you, Corn Pope, for starting the, the wave of, uh, of polls that everyone else, I like to think I was first. Joe may say he was first, but I, I was first with the cool polls. Uh, others are, are coming now. Thank you so much for that idea, Corn Pope. And so are some of you, well, someone just said, uh, how about the, oh yeah, legal vices do the USS Forrestal fire. Eh, it's possible. We might do that. Uh, just as a, as a weird side note, I used to make a model of the aircraft carrier, the, the, the USS Forrestal, when I was a kid. And we had a friend whose father worked for the Fish and Game Company, so he'd get like waterproof M80 firecrackers. And we, I just, for some reason, I, I loved, ma I made the USS Forrestal about 10 times the model. Uh, we'd, we'd glue the airplanes to the deck, and then we'd put it, we put it once in a swimming pool, like one of the little plastic bottom swimming pools, but then we found out what an M80 firecracker will do to it. So then we put it in the stream behind the house. We used to throw firecrackers at the uh, USS Forrestal model, trying to sink it. Uh, <laughs> so that's what we did as a kid. So, all right, everybody, thank you so much. There's, there's really nowhere to send you today. Uh, the Murdoch trial isn't going on. And let's see how we're doing. I'm, I'm just going to check back in here on Retired Afloat. How are they doing? 960 subscribers. You guys gave them 100 subscribers today. They need 40 more to get to 1,000 subscribers. If there's 40 of you that have any, any desire whatsoever to help out a little maritime sailing-related channel, go over to the Retired Afloat. The link is down there below. Show them your support for the video we just did. If they can get 40 more subscribers, that would be super awesome, and I doubt they, they would care that I use their videos if I can get them 150 subscribers in one day. That is so awesome of you guys to support that channel. Deeply, deeply appreciate it. Um, I'm just checking to see if anybody is live right now that I can funnel our feed into. If any of you, if you, any of you know anybody that's going right now, let me know and I will set it up. I'm just kind of going to the setting it up place right now and uh, I'll just kind of send it wherever if there is anybody. Let's see, who is streaming now that we can redirect to? Nobody. Nobody that I can see. So, all right then. There we go. That's it. This is the end of Maritime Monday. Thank you so much for being here for this horrific story. Oops, I've got something starred here. What do I have starred? Ah, we already read that one. Let me just double check, make sure I've got all the super chats done. Let me see if I got all this. I do have all of these. Oh, 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 no, I did not. We missed one while I was looking at the other site. Here is our final super chat OD day. Scrolling back up. 
It is from Bass. The Ferengi comparison could top entertainment value. I'm going to have to do more research. Oh, we already, okay, we did you, Chris. We'll, we'll show you up here on the stream. I will do more research into the, uh, I'll, I'll look at the list. It was mailed, it was emailed to me. So I have the, the Ferengi list now. I'll have to do some more research and comparison into the, the uh, Dutch East India Company to see how many of these, these points we can match up. And if it works, then we'll, we'll go ahead and do that. So, all righty there. Let's wrap this up. We'll see you tomorrow for some weird, weird cross-examination from a really weird, creepy recon crime scene reconstruction guy that was just an odd, odd duck. So until then, take care, everybody. Thank you so much for your support. Thank you so much for being here. Love you all. Respect to everyone. Mod, couldn't do this without you. You guys rock. Love you, Mod. Chat, you are the greatest single chat on the entire YouTube platform. Do not let anyone else tell you otherwise. The Vice Squad is top notch. Thank you to everyone that supported today with your super chats. Bless you all. Makes it all worth it. Love you. See you tomorrow. Until then, make sure you enjoy your legal vice.